Well, a very good evening to you all and welcome to this, uh, the next in our series of lectures for Towers of Faith on Origin, Tertullian and the Transfiguration. The Transfiguration is that great story of Jesus' remarkable display of glory in the Synoptic Gospels. Sometimes misunderstood and overlooked, but the episode is a staple in the life of the Orthodox Church. This lecture touches on the teaching of both Origen and Tertullian. Uh, Origen of Alexandria was born around 184 and is one of the church fathers, a Christian scholar and aesthetic, and who has written roughly 2,000 treatises on various and multiple branches of theology. He has been described as the greatest genius of the early churches ever produced. Uh, Tertullian was born around 155 in Carthage and was a prolific author, an early Christian apologist and a polemicist against heresy, including Gnosticism. An important contribution was made to the, to the development by Tertullian, but despite this, he was never formally declared a saint by either the East or Western church traditions. This lecture this evening is given to us by uh, the Reverend Dr. Peter Anthony, the vicar of the parish of Kentish Town, which is the second best K town in, uh, in London after Kensal Town, um, at which we, where he arrived in the summer of 2013, having come from working in Oxford at St. Stephen's House and Merton College. He's originally from Bolton, uh, but became an ordinand of the Diocese of London after having worked on the pastoral assistance scheme at St. Paul's in Tottenham. Mm -hmm. He was formed and trained for ordination at St. Stephen's House in Oxford and served a curacy in Hendon. He's a biblical scholar of some note, uh, teaches the pastoral assistance scheme theology seminars here in London, and is one of the editors of the new blog, All Things Lawful and Honest. Uh, Father Anthony, thank you very much for being with us this evening, and uh, I shall hand over to you. Thank you very much indeed. Excellent. It's so good to be here. I'm really pleased about this. Um, yes, I think tonight's uh, seminar will probably be more about Tullian than Origin, actually, in the end, when I look through my notes again this afternoon to sort of look at it all. Um, but I want, to, I, I want to look at the way in which the Transfiguration Biblical narrative, particularly the one uh, that Luke offers us, is interpreted in the early church. Now, one thing you basically find is, um, if you, if you look at large amounts of modern biblical scholarship uh, all about the Transfiguration, um, modern biblical scholars haven't really got very much to say about it. They're talking about an incident that essentially many of them suspect never actually happened. And their interest really is a historical one. How on earth did this text come to emerge? How, how was it put together? Um, uh, those sorts of questions. When you look in the early church, you discover that actually very frequently there are much more rich interpretations. It's, it's a crucially important text. And early writers see the really great significance of uh, this incident and uh, what the gospel writers are trying to tell us uh, through it. One of the things particularly I want to look at is the way in which I think Luke uh, particularly emphasizes the transfiguration as a a sort of visionary experience uh, and he picks up um, and adds all sorts of little uh, notes and details that are frequently overlooked in modern scholarship but which are noticed by early patristic commentators. Um, uh, there's this great myth that of course all early comment on the Bible is sort of pre-critical, in other words it's not attentive to the text or it's um, not historically well informed enough to be able to make good comments on it. It's, it's purely saccharine and devotional. It's a complete nonsense. What you discover when you look at patristic interpretation of the New Testament is that uh, uh, patristic commentators were exceptionally uh, critical in the sense of being attentive to the text and noticed these little things, these odds and ends that Luke adds in a way that frankly lots of modern biblical scholars don't um, uh, notice. Now, I, at this point, I just need to screen share um, the text of the Transfiguration narrative. Can everybody see that now? Could somebody with a voice let me yes. know? That you, you can all see that. Great, excellent. So I just want to have a very quick look at, let's look at Luke's version of the Transfiguration. Um, how do I get rid of... Oh, there we are. Yeah, excellent. Now, about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up 
on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep. Very important, we'll come to that in a minute. But since they'd stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. We'll come on to that in a minute. Not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them. Oh, just a minute. Has that? Oh, bugger. What just happened? Just as they were leaving him, Peter said, Jesus said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. Now there are two or three odds and ends that Luke adds to this, which I want to look at. Um, if I can just stop the share and go back to gallery view. Good. Um, one of the odd things that Luke adds, which nobody else seems to, is this strange mention of sleep. Uh, we'll come on to the significance of that in a minute. But the Greek is rather um, curious, and it doesn't actually say that disciples fell asleep and then woke up. Um, the implication is that they enter a sort of woozy liminal zone and then suddenly come to themselves. Um, the translation in the NRSV is quite good. Um, it says that they were heavy with sleep, and when they wakened, they saw his glory. The other funny little thing um, that Luke changes is the description of what was wrong with Peter's suggestion about the, um, the three booths. Um, he says, um, you know, let us make three booths, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. Now, the really intriguing thing is that when you look at what the other evangelists said, that's slightly different. Um, when you look at um, St. Mark's version, it says that Peter, um, it says this of Peter, for he did not know what to say. So there's a really important difference there. Not knowing what he said and not knowing what to say. So Mark presents Peter as being befuddled, uh, not knowing the appropriate thing that he should say. Luke says something slightly different, that Peter did not know what he was saying. Now that could mean a number of things, uh, but we'll come on to how Tertullian and Origen uh, interpret it in a moment, because it, it ends up being a really, really crucial verse. Now when you look at modern biblical scholarship, about if you want to go and look that up and work out what it's actually saying, you'll discover no one really has anything to say about it. Um, modern biblical commentaries will say, oh yes, well Luke says, you know, didn't, not knowing what he said, and Mark says, not knowing what to say, not much difference there, basically the same thing. Not so in patristic comment, they notice that there's a very slight difference between those two comments. Not knowing what he said, not knowing what to say. And Tertullian is one of the first people to really spot it and uh, go to town on it. So if we look at what uh, Tertullian has to say about the Transfiguration, we discover that the Transfiguration had probably become quite an important story in the um, debate that he was having on the one hand with Marcionites and on the other hand with Montanists. I'll explain what those are um, in a minute. 
and that the transfiguration was being used as a bit of a cannonball to shoot back and forth uh, between these various camps. And so they subject the transfiguration to very, very close and interesting interpretation. So Tertullian, who's a, a North African writer, he's the first bloke to write in Latin, or the first Christian theologian to write in Latin. Um, and uh, he's broadly speaking, in many respects, he's writing against one lot of people and in favour of another lot of people. He's one big um, adversary of his is Marcion. Um, and the people he's trying to uh, write in favour of are the Montanists. So who the hell were these people? Well, Marcion was a very peculiar heretic who basically um, thought that when uh, Jesus uh, was born, the God that he revealed to us was a completely different God from the one that we'd experienced in the Old Testament. The Old Testament God was a fearful figure, um, a God of hate and anger. The God of love that we see in Jesus must therefore be a different God. And so Marcion had a big thing against the Old Testament. And he got rid of all the Hebrew scriptures, said you don't really need any of that. And he had a very kind of Pauline gospel. In other words, um, a very much a gospel that said that everything that Jesus represents is a doing away with the old covenant. What Jesus represents is something new and different, uh, coming along and doing away with all that. One of the things that he did was he published his own version of the New Testament, which was basically just the Pauline epistles plus a kind of um, chopped up and rearranged, borderlerized version of uh, St. Luke's Gospel. Now, Tertullian thinks this is a whole lot of really, this is really dangerous thought, and he writes extensively against Marcion, arguing for the unity of the Old and New Testaments, that these are not, in fact, two different gods in competition with one another, but that through the whole of the Christian scriptures, we see the revelation of um, the uh, purposes of the one true God. And he uses the transfiguration as a really important um, uh, uh, source of evidence, I suppose, in his argument against Marcion. Now, the Montanists, who were they? They were sort of first century charismatic evangelicals. Um, they followed, uh, there's this rather curious individual called uh, Montanus who, um, uh, started prophecy sort of in the middle of the prophesying in the middle of the second century and all sorts of strange things went on in uh, association with um, uh, meetings of the Montanists. They were basically a very 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 frothy uh, charismatic sect that believed very strongly in new charismatic revelation. Uh, one of the things for example there's this rather strange conviction they had that two small Turkish towns of Papusa and Tinian were in fact the New Jerusalem. They were all basically completely crackers, it's as simple as that. Um, but they were incredibly popular because in the ancient world, um, precisely the sort of charismatic prophecy that they were offering was incredibly uh, interesting and um, chimed very well with the kind of sensibility of people that were used to go into the um, heathen temples of the ancient world and uh, receiving prophecies there. Now, Tertullian was not a Montanist, broadly speaking, large numbers of people now think, but um, he was very influenced by them and he um, had a great deal of sensitivity and sensibility for some of their claims. He particularly was very much in favour of spirit filled prophecy. And so uh, he uses the transfiguration there as well. So let's get on with this and have a look at what he said. First of all, where do we find some of the stuff that I want us to look at tonight? Well, um, uh, Tertullian wrote a great text called Adversus Marcionem, which is basically a massive, great big sort of bitch slap against Marcion, telling him how he's got absolutely everything wrong. And uh, there's extensive uh, writing drawing on many sources and many um, uh, philosophical arguments about how Marcion has got, got it wrong. So what did Marcion's version of the Transfiguration look like? Um, it's very difficult to piece it all together because the only place we can find it is 
by sort of looking in between looking in between the lines of some of the bitchy comments that um, Tertullian makes about it and also that other commentators say about it. So the only evidence we've got to go off is what um, Marcin's enemies have to tell us about this. But one of the things it looks like uh, Marcin removed from his Transfiguration account was verse 31. In other words, he removed Moses and Elijah from the Transfiguration. I think one of the things that he was trying to show was to get rid of any kind of depiction of Jesus in the company of these two great representatives of the Hebrew scriptures and of Hebrew prophecy. So Marcin can't cope with that because of course these are the representatives of the angry God of the Old Testament and so he quite simply cuts them out of the transfiguration. Um, Tertullian tells us, he says this, even though Marcin did not want to be shown in, um, did not want Jesus to be shown in conversation with um, with Moses and Elijah, but just standing there. So it looks like he may have removed these mentions of Moses and Elijah from his version of the Transfiguration. He may also have removed um, the portion from the cloud, this is my son, my chosen, listen to him. In other words, um, uh, possibly arguing that that's to be interpreted as listen to him to Jesus not to Moses and Elijah so it's rather it's difficult to work out precisely what it involved but certainly Marcion had to go chopping up the transfiguration and removing from it anything that implied that um, uh, Jesus's ministry was connected with and rooted in the prophecies of the Old Testament so how does Tertullian use the transfiguration in his argument against Marcion well, he's really fascinated by this little mention that Peter um, does not know what he was saying. Because Tertullian wonders, um, when he says Peter doesn't know what he was saying, does it actually mean that Peter was in some sort of ecstatic trance? In other words, he didn't know what he was saying in the sense that he was, he was in an, a state of ecstasy. It's not that he just didn't know what to say, he hadn't got a clue what he ought to utter, but that he was actually um, in some sort of ecstatic trance. Um, in Adversus Marcionum, uh, 1422, he, he expands this at great length and he says this, this is Tertullian, how not knowing? Was it the result of a simple mistake? Or was it because of the reason which we, in our argument for the new prophecy, in other words, that's uh, the adherence of Montanism, we, in our argument for the new prophecy, claim that ecstasy, or being beside oneself, goes hand in hand with grace. But when someone is in the spirit, especially when he glimpses the glory of God, or when God is speaking through him, he must necessarily leave his senses, because he is surely overwhelmed by the power of God a question about which there is debate between us and carnal men. So Tertullian thinks this is really great. Here's an example of someone in an ecstasy, a, a state of charismatic um, um, uh, um, ecstasy that gives him insight and vision into something that he wouldn't have if he weren't in that state of charismatic uh, ecstasy. In other words, you can see where the argument's going. In other words, like us Montanists, these frothy charismatic individuals who are quite in favor of the idea that further charismatic revelation is a good thing. So Tertullian quite likes that and he starts seeing Peter on the Mount of Transfiguration as an individual in a state of ecstasy. So um, who were these Montanists and what were they up to? Well I think 90% of them were just completely um, nutty crackpots to be honest they believed they believed in the value and worth of charismatic revelation in addition to that which was revealed in the gospel now there was a point where people spoke about montanism as if it was a kind of a very set definite um uh sort of sect in the ancient world i think increasingly modern scholarship probably sees this more as a, a kind of diverse group, series of groups of people who share a similar sort of 
um, instinct that um, charismatic prophecy is important in the life of the church. The other thing which a lot of recent scholarship has shown is that many groups and individuals whom we've come to regard as orthodox may well have had opinions that were pretty close to the kind of things that Montanists um, were believing in. Um, a sort of uniting characteristic of this range of people was some degree of allegiance to the new prophecy, um, um, which was given by um, its founder, Montanus, and an exalting of the importance of prophetic utterance in the teaching and ordering of the church. So the point of highlighting the influence of Montanism on Tertullian is to recognise the way in which his comment on the transfiguration emerges from a context highly sensitised to visionary prophetic experience and its polemic defence within the life of the church. Now, he uses this word ecstasy. So what on earth does he mean by it? Well, um, broadly speaking, I think what he's using, uh, he, he brings into Latin for the first word this, for the first time, this Greek word ecstasy. And ecstasis in Greek simply means to stand outside yourself. So there's a sort of um, ecstatic removing of yourself from your usual mind, your usual place, and standing outside yourself in a place of particular revelation. And it's Tertullian that I think probably brings that Greek word into Latin for the first time. The other Latin word he uses is amentia, which basically means sort of mindlessness, that your, your mind is either um, switched off or turned into another mode and goes into a different kind of mode of receptivity. What I think Tertullian is using is he's using two words which, generally speaking, tended to have negative connotations. So ancient philosophers were, generally speaking, quite hesitant about the worth of ecstasy and amentia because it was um, precisely seen as a kind of leaving of your reason behind. You would come out with all sorts of mad, crazy, raving things in a state of ecstasy precisely because your mind, with its reason, was incapable of governing it. So ecstasy was actually a very dangerous thing. But Tertullian uses this language to start talking about the transfiguration. I think one of the things he's using is this shock language, which would usually be seen as quite negative, but where he's saying, look, here we are, right at the heart of the transfiguration. You've got Peter in a state of kind of crazy, charismatic, uh, visionary ecstasy. So he's using, he's using shock language which would usually be seen as quite negative and he's trying to put a positive spin on it I think. Now one of the reasons I think why Tertullian uses this language is to do with his understanding of what the human soul is. One of the problems with ecstasy in the ancient world is if, if you have a platonic understanding of the soul that's basically made up of three parts, um, one part is made up of sort of logos or reason, the second part is made up of, is made up sort of for the emotions. And the third part is the place where desire and appetite comes from. What they used to think was when someone goes into an ecstatic state, their reason flees from that part of the brain and something else comes in, be it um, a demonic possession or something else. And so what's received in ecstasy, in charismatic ecstasy, is actually very dangerous because your reason has gone. The, the, the reasonable part of your brain that can judge um, wisely whether this is true or not has actually been expelled from your mind. And so ecstasy is thoroughly dangerous um, and is not a good way of um, uh, getting to the truth. The difference is, however, that Tertullian holds a much more stoic understanding of the soul. So he doesn't have a platonic understanding. He is much more convinced by the Stoic account of what the soul is, which holds a sort of unitary soul. So not a soul that's made up of three parts where one can flee and something else takes its place, but rather that the soul is a, a unity. And although reason may be diminished or retreat, reason can never completely leave the soul. So even if you're in a state of ecstasy, your reason will still always be there. 
and it's not possible to have a kind of unreasonable form of ecstasy. So precisely uh, for the reason that others would see ecstasy as being dangerous, Tertullian thinks it's useful and good. You can see all sorts of things that you wouldn't usually see um, precisely because um, by the gift of God's spirit, new revelations are given to you and your soul can never be fundamentally unreasonable because reason will never actually leave it, even though it may be diminished um, or may retreat in some sense. Does that make sense? Um, does anybody want me to repeat that? Or So I think one of the things that's going on here is that um, it's Tertullian's understanding of what the soul is that makes him think that, in actual fact, fact, ecstasy and mad, raving, wild uh, visions under ecstatic states are actually quite a good thing. Now, one of the things that uh, Tertullian seems to think this is close to is sleep. And guess what? Luke is the only transfiguration narrative where we hear that the disciples are sleepy during the vision. Um, in a number of places, Tertullian speaks um, about ecstasies being a bit like what happens in sleep. In sleep, he explains, the physical body rests and the physical senses um, that perceive the world go into abeyance. That's what happens to us every night when we go to sleep. But the soul does not rest, but continues to imagine and perceive and visualise. Because the limbs of the body are resting, the soul uses its own limbs, its imaginary limbs, so to speak, to give expression to its activity in dreams. So dreams are like a gladiator without weapon um, or a charioteer without horses, still gesticulating and going through the actions of their sport, but un unable to stop their combat. It's like someone in, in bed wrestling around with the, you know, you can imagine a charioteer in bed having a, having a dream about driving his chariot, and it's actually his mind that's still working and still visualizing. Um, Tertullian says, there's an action, but no real effect. We call this power ecstasy, which is a leaving of the senses and resembles mindlessness, I mean, to you. So he, he sees it as being very similar to what everyone experiences every night in their dreams. The problem is dreams can sometimes be vague or inconsistent or ambiguous, can't they? And so um, uh, the next question is, well, how do you remember your dreams? How do you work out what dreams are truthful and what dreams are just mad raving nonsense because you ate too much cheese before you went? Well, one of the things that Tarling says is really important is memory and reason. So the reason you remember certain dreams but you forget others is because of reason. And in exactly the same way that Peter experienced on Mountain of Transfiguration, you need reason to help you remember the dreams that are good. So again, it's reason retreats, reason may fall back or somehow be diminished, um, but you need reason still to remember the dream. Um, this is, I mean, this is just pure Freud before Freud. I mean, it's extraordinary. T Tertullian basically suggests um, um, that our reasoning faculties seek to suppress what we imagine in dreams. I mean, you know, Professor Freud would say this, you know, uh, sort of, you know, uh, in the last century. Our reasoning faculties seek to suppress what we imagine in dreams. However, when in, you're in a state of ecstasy, that controlling action of the intellect um, is momentarily withdrawn, allowing us to remember the image or the message that God wishes us to um, have communicated to us. Um, and for an ecstatic dream or vision to be preserved in our consciousness, reason needs paradoxically to retreat and to cease to act as it usually does, but it also needs to um, be there and it doesn't disappear entirely, otherwise the dream wouldn't be remembered. So it's, it's pure Freud. I mean, Freud said absolutely nothing new. Tertullian had said it all before, several centuries before, that the reason retreats. Reason usually tries to keep all the mad stuff down. And in dreams, reason lets its grip go and the mad stuff pours out. Um, but it's also the fact that reason is still there 
that means you can remember it. So um, if we think about that, um, let's just compare that very briefly with someone else who picks up on the whole thing to do with Peter, and that's Origen. Now Origen was writing at almost exactly the same time as Tertullian, uh, but in a very, very different place in Alexandria. Um, he's working within a very, very different philosophical and cultural context. Um, uh, um, and he's very influenced by um, you know, um, Jewish Platonic thought. An amazing mind, an extraordinary individual. Um, but it's really interesting that he too spots this little thing about Peter not knowing what he was saying. However, he thinks that it's really, really bad. Whereas Tertullian says, this is really great. Here's a good example of um, Peter being in ecstasy. Origen says, oh no, this is really bad. Um, what we discover in Origen is that he spots this little thing as well. This little mention that all these modern biblical scholars don't pick up. Um, so Origen, he has a commentary on Matthew and there are some homilies on Luke in which he comments on the transfiguration. Um, he's really interested about the way in which um, Jesus appeared differently to different people. And he's convinced that one of the things that happens is that um, Jesus appears differently to the disciples, but the disciples' mind is also altered to enable them to see it. Um, um, but he points out, he spots his little thing to do with Peter, and he, he says this. Um, you will consider whether he said this in a trance, um, cat ecstasin, in others, in, in a trance, in, in ecstasy, filled with a spirit which prompted him to say these things. So St. Peter was in an ecstasy, filled with a spirit that prompted him to say, let us build these three booths, a, a stupid idea. Now, Origen then sort of keeps like a dog with a bone, doesn't drop this idea and says, oh, well, I wonder what spirit that is. Well, of course, this was before the bestowal of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, so it can't be the Holy Spirit so therefore, the only logical answer left is that on the Mount of Transfiguration, St. Peter, when he's in this ecstasy, is possessed by a demonic spirit. So Origen is convinced that when Peter says um, he, uh, or when Luke says of Peter that he doesn't know what he's saying, that in actual matter of fact, he's possessed by a demonic spirit. Now, what on earth is going on there? What is demonic about it? Well, I think Origen thinks, um, basically Origen thinks that Peter wants to keep Jesus on the mountaintop so that he doesn't go down to Jerusalem and effect our salvation uh, by offering himself in the Passion and rising again. So Origen spots in this little comment that Peter didn't know what he was saying. He too thinks that this shows that Peter is in, a, is in a state of ecstasy. The only difference between him and Tertullian is he thinks that's very, very bad. So he thinks Peter is in a possessed by a demonic spirit who's trying to keep Jesus on the top of the mountain and uses Peter through his suggestion of the um, three booths to keep him there. So you have two commentators saying, they, they share the idea that they both spot that Peter is in some sort of ecstatic state where they, where they um, depart company from each other is whether they think that's bad or good. Tullian thinks that ecstasy can never be truly um, uh, unreasonable because even in a state of ecstasy, you continue to have your, um, your faculty of reason. Whereas Origen is much, much more suspicious of ecstasy and thinks it's just sort of rainy, raving lunatic utterances. And in actual matter of fact here is, is demonic in a way. <coughs> so if I just go back to Tertullian, just very briefly to, um, I'll conclude in a few moments. Tertullian has argued in favour of um, the Montanists, and he sees in Peter a really good example of charismatic ecstatic vision. 
that he thinks is just quite simply a, um, a good example of exactly the same thing that Montanists are doing. He then goes on to speak against the Marcionites and he wants to prove that the Transfiguration shows that the Old Testament and the New Testament are part of one prophetic whole. And he does it in all sorts of complicated different ways and he embarked on a very complex and quite interesting but also at times rather bewildering series of connections between the Transfiguration and the Old Testament. Um, some of them he sees as being predictions that are fulfilled in the Transfiguration. Um, others he sees as being typological connections, particularly with Sinai. Um, other things he sees as being comments in the Psalms that simply are described in the Transfiguration as well. Uh, so there are lots of Old Testament elements that he draws on. I just want to point you to two things. And he sees, particularly in the prophets Habakkuk and Zechariah, a very different and particular form of prophetic link to the Transfiguration. Um, Habakkuk um, chapter 3 is widely seen as um, uh, looking forward to the Transfiguration. I'll just read it to you now. Um, O Lord, I have heard of your renown, and I stand in awe, O Lord, of your work. In our own time, revive it. In our own time, make it known. In wrath, may you remember your mercy. God came forth from Taman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. The brightness was like the sun. Rays came forth from his hand where his power was hidden. Before him went pestilence, and plague followed behind him close. He stopped and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. So this vision of, um, uh, of um, God's glory going forth from a mountaintop place is frequently interpreted in patristic comment as looking forward to the transfiguration. Um, but Tullian has got something very specific to say about it, because he wonders whether Habakkuk himself had a prophetic vision in which he saw the transfiguration ahead of time. He says this, We have an entire outline of this vision in Habakkuk as well, where the spirit in the person of some of the apostles says, Lord, I have heard your hearing and was afraid. What can this be other than the heavenly voice? This is my son, hear him. I considered your works and was astounded. What can this be other than when Peter saw his brightness and did not know what he should say? So one of the things that seems to be going on in Tertullian's comment is that he sees in Habakkuk's prophecy, Habakkuk himself, visualizing and seeing forward. It's not just that what Habakkuk writes when you look at it later happens to look like the Transfiguration. It's that the, the prophet himself has some sort of visual um, intuition of what's going to happen in the Transfiguration. Similarly to in Zechariah, he says this, Zechariah also saw these, i.e. Moses and Elijah, in the figure of the two olive trees and the two olive branches. That's in Zechariah 4 where you see the two olive um, trees. Well, these are the ones about whom it was said to him, two noble ones stand by the Lord of the whole earth. So um, Tertullian doesn't just see correspondences between the Old Testament and Transfiguration in the sense that there are typological things or predictions made. He also sees a deep connection between what the prophets of the Old Testament saw in their visions and what Peter, James and John saw in, in the visions of their mind when they witnessed the transfiguration on the um, on the mount of transfiguration so very briefly just to close i'll now i think i'll try and piece together what i think tertullian thinks is going on in the transfiguration um so um his understanding of ecstasy as analogous with sleep coheres closely with luke's transfiguration account Luke is the only evangelist to mention the disciples' descent into a sleepy state. Um, and I think the logic of what um, Tertullian has to say in a number of contexts uh, 
would be to see um, that he sees that slipping into the sleepy state as marking the beginning of their amintia or their ecstasy. Their physical sense is going to abeyance as if in sleep, and Peter is no longer aware of what he says, even when he speaks to suggest the three tabernacles. Now, a further question is how the disciples get to see Moses and Elijah if they're in this crazy state. Well, in Tertullian's uh, work, De Anima, uh, book nine, Tertullian insists that one of the characteristics of ecstasy is the ability it affords to see departed souls. Now, he does so with reference to the experience of a Montanist prophetess that he knows. Wait until you hear this. This will send shivers down the spine of every parish priest here. He says, we have a sister amongst us um, at the moment who has been given several gifts of revelation, which she experiences in ecstasy through the spirit during the liturgy on the Lord's Day in church. I can imagine she was the biggest pain in the arse in the history of pains in the arse, to be quite frank. So they've got this mad old bag who's having these visions during the parish mass every week. And Tertullian thinks this is absolutely wonderful. I can think of nothing else. So she experiences in ecstasy through the spirit each week during the liturgy on the Lord's Day. Amongst other things, she says, a soul has been shown to me in corporeal form and its spirit has been seen by me. It did not have a void and empty quality, but rather such that it gave itself to be touched, tender and bright, of a transparent colour, and its outline was human in all respects. So they've got this mad old woman who's having these visions every Sunday. And one of the key things that Tertullian says is that this is one of the kind of, this is the uh, sort of consequence of ecstasy that you can see visions of departed souls. So I suspect Tertullian then sees that's why Peter is able to see Moses and Elijah, these two departed souls who appear there on the mount in the transfiguration. <coughs> so I think several conclusions can be drawn from our survey of Tertullian's interpretation of the transfiguration. The first is to recognise the importance of his interest in visionary prophecy. I think that leads him to see in the Transfiguration a key text on the legitimising of ecstatic vision within the church by interpreting Peter's experience as ecstatic. Tertullian's polemic um, draws him to see ecstatic elements in the Lucan narrative as key evidence in his anti-Marcionite argument. His use of language is of singular importance, especially the word ecstasy, which he defines in terms of the more widely understood Latin term amentia. His varied comments on vision and ecstasy allow us to piece together a reasonably precise summary of Tertullian's understanding of the visionary character of the Transfiguration. He understands it to include, in addition to the physical faculty of sight, the memory and imagination's ability to visualize realities revealed to them in the spirit in a way not dissimilar to the processes that happen when we dream in sleep. In addition, this interest in ecstatic vision leads to Tullian to interpret the transfiguration in the light of the Hebrew scriptures. He views prophetic vision as a crucial part of the way in which the transfiguration is to be seen as the fulfillment of texts from the Old Testament, both inspiring the writers of Hebrew prophecy but also those who read the Transfiguration narratives in Tertullian's time. Of great significance is the way in which these interpretive insights are garnered by Tertullian from a reading of Luke's Gospel, or at least the slightly altered Marcionite version of Luke's Transfiguration, which he comments upon in Adversus Marciona. Tertullian's polemic uh, uh, needs him uh, to see visionary and ecstatic elements as a crucial character of Luke's narrative. So I've been going on a bit. Was that about 40 minutes or so? I think that's the end of what I have to say. Shall I ha who do I hand back to now? It's me, Father Peter. Thank you. How, was long, how long was that? Uh, that was about right. That was spot that on. Right? Time we were, yes, 10 to absolutely beautifully. Thank you very much.
the um, absolutely fascinating and, and it changed the transfiguration for me. I can't recall reading anything like that up until this point. And, and your um, your talk this evening had highs. Obviously, the bitch like. Uh, the bitch slaps the master knights was uh, was a definite high but the low point was the lack of commentary in the contemporary world on some of your points that's disappointing to hear uh, but your uh, thinking on charismatic ecstasy i have to tell you has left me flat but i'm sure that's because my reason has left me been expelled by my passion <laughs> and what a wonderful new way to start thinking of peter at the transfiguration though that sounds like that's something that's well worth delving into a little more. Well, as long as the spirit is the Holy Spirit and not something rather more demonic. I'm sure that there are going to be lots of questions about your talk this evening. Thank you. But first of all, let me tell you all about next week, which couldn't be more different if it tried. We'll be welcoming the radically orthodox John Milbank, who will be talking oh, to heavens. <laughs> <laughs> a little different, Father Peter, a little different. Radically orthodox John Milbank, who will be talking to us about Sergei Bulgakov. Now, despite his photograph, he's not actually Rasputin, uh, but he seems to share a significant number of traits, including a very complex character in a particularly turbulent time of Russian history. So tune in next Wednesday at 7pm to find out more about him. But now I'm going to hand over to Father Chris, who is going to field the questions. Thank you, Father Matthew. Um, I'm sure that there will be lots of questions after that. Um, if you want to ask Father Peter a question, um, please either physically gesticulate or uh, use the raise hand button um, on, the, on the console in front of you. And uh, I'll just have a quick scan through to see if there's anybody with their hand up. Uh, maybe we need a few minutes just to... Is that Father Alex with his hand up? Oh, yes, indeed. Thank you. You'll need to unmute yourself. I wasn't raising my hand, I think. I think Father Matthew is playing tricks again, Father. <laughs> It's given Charlotte time to raise hers, though. Yeah. All right, fine. Um, thank you for that, Father Peter. That was that was fascinating. I have to say, I've um, I've had a very pedestrian interpretation of that, which is just that Peter, as normal, didn't think through the implications <laughs> of what he was going to say. Um, but I'm very interested in what the contemporary reception of uh, Tertullian's thoughts. On this was was this a sort of widely um, accepted view, or did it uh, did he release this uh, to to great uh, either silence or consternation? Um, no, uh, the, the 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 reason why I did quite a bit of it um, in the research I was doing on this project was um, it sort of disappears without trace, really. Um, Origen and Tertullian, it's extraordinary how they're writing at almost exactly the same time, but they definitely see this hint uh, that Luke drops, that there's something visionary going on. It, it, it isn't taken up particularly frequently later. It does, it bubbles up and down, bubbles up and down, but there's no one that quite so unequivocally um, explores it as, as Tertullian and origin do so it that it's sort of a it's like a bubble that bursts and it opens and then sort of uh peters out um peters out a bit after that uh, and certainly does complete death in modern scholarship no one sees any significance in that phrase other than that it's just a sort of description of of, of peter not really knowing just being you know befuddled the other thing i often worry i wonder about which I could find no evidence of in the patristic period was um, not knowing what he said, not knowing what he said. Now, how else could you interpret that? Could you interpret Luke meaning that ironically, um, let us make three booths here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not knowing what he said, not knowing how close to the truth he was so could it actually be, rather than a criticism of Peter, could it actually be approbation? 
In other words, could Peter's insight that the experience has something to do with tabernacles, booths, sacred space, the temple, all that stuff, that the moment you start talking about tabernacles and booths and tents, could it actually be that Luke is hinting that Peter is much closer to the reality than he realises? Or indeed, is Luke saying both those things at once? Is it like a, an ambiguous sentence that could be interpreted in both ways? I've not yet found anyone that thinks that when Peter doesn't know what he's saying, that that's actually a, a narrative approval of him, saying, goodness me, you know, he was so close to the truth, he didn't know what he meant. Do you know what, do you know what I mean? Not if I ever, if you know of any comment, let me know because that would make my day. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you very much for that. Um, does anyone else have any questions to ask? I don't see any. Uh, John, is that a, are you wanting to ask a question, John? If I may, you may indeed. Um, does Tertullian come up with an idea as to why, why they're in that state, why the, um, the ecstasy occurs? I'm thinking, um, is it possibly because they're in the divine presence, thinking along the lines of in Matthew 28 at the tomb, the two soldiers are like dead, shook like dead, but they're obviously standing there, again, out of mind possibly. Um, mm. Anything in that at all? Oh, that's, a, uh, that's an interesting comparison. I hadn't thought about that. Um, uh, no, so uh, what's the question? Why are they like that? Um, no, Origen goes on endlessly about... Um, Origen sees in the moving up, going up the hill, a metaphor for the way in which the only way in which you can experience the divine presence is by vast preparation, ascesis fasting, prayer. And so Origen sees in A, the idea that only three were picked, and B, that they went up a mountain, that there was, there was need for preparation by, and it could only be seen by a very small number of people. So in Origen, you've got a strong sense that this revelation is so important, so extraordinary, so overwhelming, that it can only be experienced by the most prepared, and then that later starts to be interpreted as clergy and monastics and all that kind of thing. Tertullian seems to, I think, to take a very different um, view and, and is, is not like that sort. Tertullian has actually quite a sort of, um, one of the points he's making is actually the fundamentally democratic character of, of ecstasy. Anyone, you don't have to be in a particular state of holiness or preparation or a particular, um, um, mode of life like a celibate or whatever or a monastic um, ecstasy is fundamentally open to anybody that enters into it um, and so one of the things that's quite important for Tullian, Tertullian is the sort of democratic sense that it, it, the, one of the points of the ecstatic experience is that just about anybody can experience it um, so they have quite different attitudes to what the transformation tells us about um, um, how you prepare to enter the divine presence, whether it's something that everyone can experience or just a s small number of people. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we've got a question on text from Ivan, um, who's, who's typed his question. Um, I'm going to give him a second just to butt in and uh, and answer ask the question himself if you want to Ivan if you unmuted yourself. I'm here yes no, no, I, I, I'm, I'm back on now thank you okay go for it yeah um uh Anthony thank you, Peter, Peter thank you very much for that um uh very very interesting especially this this uh idea of uh Peter not knowing what to say which uh adds a dimension to the the the, the, the uh, ecstatic conversation but I'm just wondering whether whether it really is that um uh, manages to 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 find a compromise between emotion and reason um, and I'm just thinking of his writing on the theater and he's absolutely dead against any possibility that emotion adds anything to the spiritual life oh. because it's reason has to be completely in control so that's uh, just wondering whether there's some other kind of way in which he finds um, a way into emotion elsewhere um, 
but also how does how does that relationship between emotion and reason help us to, to to read this narrative for us today? And gosh, I hadn't thought about that. Are we? Are we? Are, I mean, are we a lot better at it now? Are we a lot, perhaps, more um, conciliatory about the fact that there is we are people of emotion, we are people of reason, and these things have to hang together and not be entirely divided in, in the spirit. I, I think I think modern biblical scholarship is catastrophically bad at interpreting. Um, anything in this narrative other than it's a collection of desiccated sort of historical comments coming from different places that I mean um, modern modern historical critical scholarship on this is just so depressing it's it, it, it's it, it doesn't see anything in it as um, a metaphor for it in the emotional experience of the divine mm. Or um, or the aesthetic preparation for vision of God for the vision of God, or anything to do with about what it means to experience the divine or God. So much of of um, modern historical critical scholarship to do with anything to do with vision just um, pairs it down to um, well the basic the basic conception of modernity with regard to vision is that it's illness if in, in modernity if if you mm. have a vision of the divine revealed to you that is evidence of mental illness and yet when you go back into antiquity i think they have a much uh, richer more honest and more variegated ex sort of experience of what it means to have mm. vision, what vision means the whole number of levels on which that's both a metaphor and an actual experience or an emotional experience. So I think it's, I think this really does sort of um, precisely point to some of the ways in which ancient scholarship, ancient biblical commentary, which has been dissed for years by 19th century biblical scholars as useless. Now, as a matter of fact, I think chimes exceptionally closely with how ordinary people read and interpret yeah. the text and also how this text is experienced and heard liturgically as well. So yeah, I, th I think you're right. I think it goes to the heart of um, um, heartfelt experience of, of both of the text mm -hmm. and of the divine presence. Um, and I, th I think we're pretty useless at it in modernity. It's a really good example where theology lags behind, biblical theology lags behind where most modern thought is at. Which, you, know. so you maybe um, go back to von Balthasar. I don't know exactly what he does. I can't remember what he does with, with uh, transfiguration. But for von Balthasar, of course, the aesthetic dimension, the um, apprehension of beauty or being, mm -hmm. being taken into the beauty of God um, is, is the, a necessary condition in order to be able to do theology, to be mm -hmm. able to think theologically. Mm, definitely. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Um, I wonder, Kira, would you like to ask a question? I think uh, you've said something on chat. I just wondered if you want to put it to Father Peter directly. Yes, um, I was just wondering if um, this sort of critical idea that Peter was talking nonsense doesn't necessarily have to take away from his experience in that it could simply be a very human reaction to an ineffable experience in which he um, sort of ha feels like he has to say something. Mm. Uh, I can see that I completely stole that from a sermon from Margaret Street I heard uh, <laughs> in which um, Father Berry said that um, sort of if, if you follow the logic that Peter is essentially the first Christian clergyman well, isn't there that sort of inner temptation as a, as a disciple, I suppose, to um, to be seen to have said something clever, which wouldn't take away from the overall experience? I I agree categorically, and um, silence is a really important part of Luke's narrative. You'll notice at the end the bit I didn't realise. Um, um, Luke's version finishes with the words, "When the voice had spoken, um, Jesus was found alone." 
and they kept silence and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. Luke adds this element. He doesn't say they said nothing. He said they kept silence. There's a Greek verb to keep silence, a bit like in, like in French, there's a verb to, to be silent, whereas in English we think of it as just not saying anything. Um, one of the things one repeatedly sees through the Hebrew scriptures is that, that constant assertion that in the face of, of the divine majesty, the only true human response is actual, is quite simply silence. Um, be still and know that I am God. One of the intriguing things that we see um, in intertestamental comment on the life of the temple, for example, is um, there's this constant refrain that somehow all the worship of the temple took place in complete silence. All the worship of the priests, all the sacrifices, all the people coming in and out took place in complete silence. Have you ever known a group of priests do anything in complete silence? I have not, I have to tell you. There's this great historical question. Why is this constant assertion made that the, that the worship of the um, temple in Jerusalem was silent because a lot of the historical descriptions we have was that it was an absolutely lunatic place of frenetic activity and if you can imagine all these priests working away hacking animals to bits throwing them on the huge bonfire in front of the Holy of Holies it's highly unlikely that it took place it's virtually impossible that it took place in silence one of the things that seems to be going on is you've got texts that make this theological point that the, the, only, the only true way for humans to respond to the divine presence is quite simply with silence. Um, so what's actually being said in those texts is actually a theological point because all the historical evidence seems to point to the fact that the Jerusalem temple was a kind of, you know, epicenter of frenetic chaos. <laughs> um, uh, in a way that we can only imagine in our worst liturgical nightmares. <laughs> um, and so what's being said is that science is actually a theological response. And that's why I think that verb is there in Luke's version, and Luke's version only, that what's been experienced on the top of the mountain is something like a temple-like experience. It's like entering the Jerusalem temple or the temple or the tent of meeting or what have you. It's like coming into the presence of the divine and the only appropriate response is complete silence. So I think, yes, you're right. I mean, you could, you could interpret all the utterances as quite simply being a bewilderment that leads to silence. Silence in the presence of the divine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Charlotte, did you want to come back on? Uh, you had another question. I did have another question. Um, Something that you, you said earlier, uh, Father Peter, struck me um, when talking about tents and tabernacles and things like that. I mean, the, the other um, sort of place that, that they use is, is the mountain, obviously. And so if they're already up a mountain, which is the sort of liminal space that, you know, you keep having in the Old Testament, if they're already up a mountain, um, why the extra sort of layer of liminality and ecstasy? Do Tertullian or Origen or anyone else for that matter explain? Well, I think, <laughs> yes, more liminality on top of enough liminality. Yes, um, yes um, there's a lot going on, I think, in Luke's version about hinting at the experience of being like, like entry into the Jerusalem temple, into the holy space, holy place. Matthew's version is the one that emphasizes most acutely um, comparisons with Moses on the top of the mountain. So it's in Matthew that Jesus's face shines. And so in Matthew, uh, there are very, very strong mosaic um, echoes of the experience on Sinai. Luke does it differently. One of the really intriguing things is what he does with the cloud. If you notice in Matthew and Mark, the cloud just comes over them that's it overshadows them in luke something slightly different happens um in verse 34 and he said this a cloud came and overshadowed them and they were afraid as they entered the cloud 
So the cloud comes over, overshadows a space, and the disciples move into it, which is different from in Matthew and Mark. So it's as if the disciples themselves are moving um, into this liminal place of divine um, habitation. Um, I think there are very strong echoes of it being a temple-like experience. <coughs> and one of the curious things that Origen does is um, he then actually starts comparing the transfiguration with a whole number of stories to do with Jesus in the temple. Um, so he starts, he refers to Jesus as a high priest in his comment on transfiguration. And then he, um, uh, he mentions the cloud as a tabernacle. And then he starts referring to instances um, in chapter two of um, the gospel according to St. Luke, um, particularly the finding in the temple. Um, and uh, he sort of says things like, um, um, uh, you know, that Mary and Joseph weren't really um, surprised when they found Jesus because they knew that, you know, the temple might be the kind of place he might have, because God lived in the temple, it might have been the place that the sort of boy Jesus might have just popped up into heaven for five minutes just to have a quick chit chat with his heavenly father and would, might have come back down again. So this idea that Mary and Joseph were completely beside themselves is complete nonsense. They knew exactly what was going on. So <clears throat> Origen, curiously, does take all those those hints at um, the mountaintop being a temple-like place, a liminal place of entry into the divine, um, and particularly those comparisons with tents of meeting, temple-like places. Origen goes to town on that quite a bit. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Um, Father Sam, I think you had a question you wanted to ask. Indeed, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Father, for your talk this evening. Uh, it's very helpful because I must confess, I always find the transfiguration quite difficult to preach on. Um, and <laughs> maybe it's just me, but it always comes across as in, in terms of the events of Jesus's life, the sort of poor relation to things like the Ascension, um, etc. And so I suppose if uh, my question would be, if you had to sort of summarize in one sort of pithy sentence of the importance of preaching on the Transfiguration, what you would say? I hate preaching on the Transfiguration too. Everyone imagines <laughs> I, am a, I, am, I am a bottomless well of perfect homilies. I get this every year when it comes up in, in, in the readings. Everyone on the phone, oh, I can't think of anything to say. What do you, you know, clergy friends ringing up and one thing or another. Um, uh, the, the, I, I also am endlessly perplexed by what to say on the transfiguration because there's so much to say. Um, there's, there's the basic idea, is this a metaphor for how we see God? And I think all sorts of different elements in it that you can take, um, the journey up the mountain, the element of the, the, the temple-like experience, the hints of uh, divine revelations from the, um, from the Old Testament. So there is there fundamentally that it's a narrative about vision and experience of God. Um, and I think I, I, I would, I'd take that as the fundamental view of the point and then maybe tease out one or two of those elements that, you know, uh, that we've been talking about it. Um, um, but I think it's fundamentally in patristic comment, it's very much seen as a metaphor for all, for for human interaction and, and experience of the divine, with sight being a much richer sense in antiquity than it is in modernity. Uh, so seeing, in modernity, we, um, seeing is a very clinical thing. We, we witness something at a distance. The eye is merely a camera, and the, the true organ of sight is actually the brain examining information. Whereas in antiquity, all models of sight involved either rays coming out of the eye and touching the thing that was beheld or the thing that was beheld sending out spooky rays to the eyes and even though these were invisible they were nonetheless felt to be tangible and physical in some sense so that you were actually physically connected to the thing you were looking at that they call it haptic vision from the verb to grab or hold 
And you can understand why right up until, um, you know, the Reformation, the Renaissance, um, you know, why seeing the elevation was seen as just as, um, uh, just as fruitful and effective uh, in embracing the divine presence as receiving communion, because seeing was seen to be a way of holding, embracing, touching something. I don't have the answer to your question. I'm not a bottomless. <laughs> no, that's very. Um, that's very helpful. Thanks. Uh, wonderful, well, full of homiletic insight as when it comes to the, the transfiguration. Um, Charles has asked uh, on text, he's asked me to ask you a question, Father Peter, because his microphone is not particularly good. Um, so it, with his permission, um, if I recall correctly, Charles says, Matthew and Mark had the transfiguration taking place six days after the previous episode, yep. whereas Luke has it taking place eight days afterwards. I've heard sermons arguing that Luke is making a point about the new creation. Do Tertullian or Origen make anything of this? Well, they do. They, yes, Origen does. Um, um, yeah, the, the, this is really, uh, the six and the eight is really good. If you're a historical critical scholar, uh, modern his, historical critical scholars are saying, oh, yeah, six days or eight days. Oh, this is just a matter of, you know, this is either just a kind of... Um, uh, simply a question of are you reckoning up the days in a Hebrew way or in a more Roman way and that in actual matter of fact Luke, Mark and Matthew are talking about exactly the same period of time it's just that Luke happens to use this uh, slightly more sort of Hellenistic way of working at counting the days so you could just say there's absolutely no significance whatsoever in that description of six or eight days since the last event Equally, you could say, in out of matter of fact, that's complete nonsense. There is deep and fundamental meaning, and in out of matter, and the, the whole idea that Luke's version mentioning eight is, in fact, a hint at the new creation is a very, very quite a frequently commented upon um, patristic topos. I think Origen does comment on it. Um, can't quite remember what he says, but if. Um, uh, um, if I can find something briefly. Um, and I think this is going to take me longer than I think. Um, uh, but one of them, uh, they definitely... Um, they definitely do. Um, I think this may take me longer than I... Um, uh, oh yeah, so Origen's going on here, but um, he's, his commentary on Matthew is actually on the six. Six is the perfect number and the whole world was made in six days, a perfect work to art. This is why I think uh, the man who transcends all the things of the world is represented in the world after six days Jesus took up with him certain men. Such a man no longer beholds visible realities which are temporal but already beholds realities that are invisible since they are eternal. So in actual matter of fact, he latches onto the six as being the um, symbol of um, representing the uh, whole perfect man. It may be Tertullian then in that case that writes about um, um, the eighth day. Um, yeah, this is going to get very boring for you. I shan't try and look it up now. But yes, it, it's, a, it's quite a frequent recurring comment. Thank you. Um, Father Alex, I think I genuinely did see your hand raised this time. Um, so, so I wonder if you had a, had a question to ask or comment. Yeah, it, was, it, yeah, it wasn't really a question as, as, as much as a, a sort of a, something that came to my mind when we were thinking of just briefly about you know sermons on the on transfiguration i think one of the th particularly sort of benedictine spirituality is as big up on the transfiguration as a metaphor for the religious life um the sort of the going up of the mountain and 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 all that sort of thing but also you know i've had sort of lots of connections with the benedictus for instance you know the light shining on people in darkness and 
and uh, and then those sort of things. That it just that's what just came to mind. You definitely get from origin in Greek thought. You get coming out of it that that the transfiguration is is basically a, a really really crucial metaphorical narrative for for the ascetic, and that the monastic life what we see on the mountain of transfiguration the going up and then the coming down is a really really crucial metaphor for the um, principally for the monastic life and it becomes very very oriented towards understanding as, as a metaphor for monastic clerical life much less um, that it's a metaphor that's more demotic and open to everybody which ironically, you that I think you get more of that in the in the Latin West actually. Um, in the um, in the East, it becomes a narrative about the difficulty of seeing God, the preparation with which one has to make before you go up to the mountain, and the constant recurring comment in patristic writing that um, if you saw the transformation without proper preparation you would either go blind or mad or both. That if you, uh, that it was just so overwhelming that it's impossible to kind of, you know, if you weren't properly prepared. Um, so yeah, it, it becomes very monastic and very clerical um, in later group thought. And certainly that begins in origin. Does anyone else have a question? Um, had a lot of really good questions. Father David. Thank you, Father. I miss most of the talk uh, being such an important person that I am. But uh, as to the question of silence, uh, and as a pastor and a theologian, I'd be interested in your insight in this. I get a little frustrated with the, a, a, in the modern church, a kind of almost premature silence. To me, and I'd be really interested in what Origen thought of this, the journey to silence is a journey of words. And you kind of, you, you have to take the, I had a great professor at, uh, in my graduate studies who said, you know, at the end of his life, Thomas Aquinas was allowed to say, uh, all the words that I've written are like dross. But he said to me, he said to us, you're not allowed to say that, right? Because you haven't spent a life of words. <laughs> Is, is the journey to silence in the, in the face of the divine a journey of words? And it, it's kind of premature to think that you can kind of enter into the silence without that journey of words. Gosh, that's a fascinating insight. Um, and if you think about Luke's version, that perfectly echoes what you're saying. Because... Um, Luke is the only person that describes the disciples and Jesus talking on the top of the mountain and describes in detail and reveals the topic of the conversation. So um, it's only in Luke, I've never thought about this before, this is a really intriguing connection you've made there. Luke is a journey of words that leads to silence because it's only in Luke that we get this um, description um, um, and behold, the two men talked with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was to accomplish at Jerusalem. So there is actually the experiences of, a, an experience of words listening into divine conversation. The departure in Greek, of course, is the word exodus, and what that means and what it's pointing to, there's endless amount of comment. But yes, that the basic paradigm you speak of there is found in Luke, um, categorically. A journey of words up to the top of the mountain, and then the silence is experienced afterwards. Hmm. Um, though Matthew does mention it as well, I'm just looking. Um, yeah, Matthew and Mark both describe Moses and Elijah speaking with Jesus, but it's only Luke who describes what they were actually talking about, which is his exodus, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. So in actual matter of fact, sorry, scratch what I said earlier on. So it's actually in all three versions. 
but there's there's definitely a journey of in loop a journey of words culminating in silence so it could actually be that the culmination is not the vision and all the hoo-ha at the top of the mountain but is the culmination actually the going down and the keeping of silence in certain eastern icons you see two lots of people you've got the, the three jesus and was in elijah in the middle and you've got two lots of people people on, on the left people going up the mountain and on the right people come down the mountain and it's just a sort of time lapse shot of the disciples going up and then coming down later um, emphasizing the idea that the, the crucial part of the story is not just what happens on the top of it of the mountain but in actual fact the journey up and the journey down is, is just as crucial the answer is yes i haven't thought about it great point thank you father that was very helpful uh, robert robert ward you've written a question on text would you like to put it father peter yourself yeah there i unmute myself can you hear me yeah just about yeah oh, good thank you yeah i just i'm interested really by, by all of this because personally i've always found the transfiguration a gift uh, when it comes around in the lectionary uh because of that extraordinary uh, metaphor for prayer and isn't there, I just wanted to ask, isn't there a tradition um, in thinking about the mystics and the mystical tradition of prayer, isn't there a tradition of the mystics themselves being transfigured, mm -hmm. being transformed? I was thinking there's an account somewhere of Evelyn Underhill, you know, after prayer or being surprised in prayer, being seen as it were transfigured and people returning from the altar after receiving the Eucharist, a similar sort of image whole thing about being divinized as in the icon tradition um i don't know whether anybody's got any comments they could make perhaps about that it seems a very very fertile mine really uh seem as it were to mine to me yes unquestionably and um yeah one does have that tradition particularly in the east where i think the trans Transfiguration is a more important theological lens through which so much more is perceived and understood. Um, um, whereas in the West, you have people developing stigmata through focusing on the cross. In the East, you have people transfigured and mm. receiving divine light as a result of a theology much more rooted and grounded in the transfiguration. Um, I, yes, uh, um, an extraordinary tradition. Um, I don't know what I'd do if any of my parishioners started glowing after going back to their seats, wow. having achieved Holy Communion in, on a Sunday morning. Oh. It would cheer the day up. In a sense. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you, yes. Uh, we've got uh, another question from Kirill. I wonder if you are still there, Kirill. And then uh, I'm just thinking it's, it's probably coming up to 8.30, so unless anyone else has got a burning question, um we, we will draw things to a close after that kirill um yeah no i was um quite interested in this idea that um if unprepared you were to meet the transfiguration you'd probably go mildly mad um i don't really know how how you could prepare for it properly but isn't um isn't peter's response so he sees moses and elijah and 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 the lord in all his glory and uh, if you were to sort of update it to modern parlance, essentially he's offering his sofa to crash on. <laughs> you know, I'll put up some accommodation for you here or there. Isn't that, isn't that slightly mad or mad? Well, I mean, it's a maddening event to witness. And so the reaction is adequately um, odd. And um, just a quick note on the um, importance of the transfiguration in the East. The most prestigious regiment in the Imperial Russian army of which I think the Tsar himself was the, the, the royal colonel, was uh, the regiment of the Transfiguration. Ah. So it, it, it goes even deeper than sort of theological discussion. It is very deeply ingrained in Orthodox spirituality. That is the most interesting thing I've heard in a very long while. That is excellent. <laughs> very good indeed. <laughs> 
I think that is everybody. And I did promise that we would uh, we would wrap up on time, and uh, it's coming up to about half past eight now. So I think, uh, with without further ado, thank you once again, Father Peter, for that really fascinating thank and stimulating much. biblical study. Uh, this evening and reflection on on uh, on the father's uh, origin and Tertullian, um, really fascinating. Thank you so much for being with us this evening, and, uh, and I look forward to seeing many of you again next week. As uh, we've already heard, we will be hearing from Professor John Milbank. So do put that one in your diary. Save the date, same time next week. Thank you all for coming.